very much, Raoult, uh, for this very kind in, <laughs> introduction. Um, as you know, when you approached me a few <laughs> weeks ago, I responded that I am not an expert in anti-Semitism or law connected to anti-Semitism. <laughs> and as you said, you know, I do law and economics, uh, jurisprudence, legal ethics, um, but I had some uh, research actually with my wife who is connected to Scotland. It's a very interesting connection here, Tilo. She is an expert in the Scottish Enlightenment about the German heritage of uh, uh, the German Jews who immigrated to Palestine and their um, effect on the Israeli legal system. And I will talk a little bit about um, um, freedom of speech and the tradition of freedom of speech, which might be relevant um, to your uh, project and congratulations for uh, winning this uh, project. Um, but <laughs> one benefit of um, this invitation, kind invitation, uh, oh, sorry, I put the right. Do you see my shared screen? Did you do you see my uh, the shared screen? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yep. Um just a second. Sorry about that. So, um, so I didn't know what I'm going to talk about, and uh, therefore I entitled my uh, uh, presentation Democracy, Freedom of Speech, and the Rule of Law, which is very, very broad. But one benefit of this invitation that I actually discovered the Gissen connection. And maybe I will start with a few words about this. Uh, my family story, because I think it's also so, has some relevance to the modern study of anti-Semitism and responses to it. Apparently, my great uncle, the, the brother of my grandfather, uh, did his doctorate at the University of Gießen in psychology. He completed uh, this is a certificate. He completed his uh, dissertation in 1900. And subsequently, he got a position in psychology at the University of Zurich and was one of the Jung circles uh, and became totally uh, assimilated secular Jew. Actually, his son was later the head of the Jewish community in Switzerland. And he and his family didn't report any anti Semitic incidents or sentiment, uh, and they had a very good life. My grandfather, uh, who stayed in Germany, um, was from, originally from Hamburg. When I received this honorary doctorate, I even saw the place where he lived, uh, subsequently moved to Frankfurt, when my, where my mother was born, um, was very orthodox, ultra-orthodox, a good Israel of Germany. And he was quite wealthy and successful businessman. And again, from the, the testimonies of my mother, uh, the early, her early years, she was born in Frankfurt in 1923. Her early years in Germany were actually uh, characterized by her as paradise. This is a theme that I will return to when I will talk about the German Jews who immigrated to Palestine before the rise uh, to Nazism and were very instrumental in the Israeli, the construction of the Israeli legal system. And so this is an interesting perspective because they were ultra orthodox, they were not assimilators and uh, they lived quite uh, happily in Frankfurt, very nice house near the old opera with a summer house in Königstein until of course the rise uh, of the Nazis to power uh, when they fled Germany, 
and not far enough to Amsterdam and uh, later on actually towards the end of the war were arrested uh, my mother, her sister and uh, my grandmother uh, transferred to Ravensbrück, which was quite a horrible camp actually for uh, mainly for political prisoners, women prisoners. And then for some reason, which is unknown until today, uh, very close to the end of the war, they were transferred to Theresienstadt, upgraded to a better camp. Apparently one uh, um, theory is that somebody from the firma of my grandfather from, Sw from Sweden interfered. But the interesting story is that be before they were uh, let into the camp, Theresienstadt, uh, they were interviewed, my mother and her sister, um, by Adolf Eichmann, who came specially from Berlin to interview them, apparently to know what do they know about the final solution, and this was 1944, and, and threatened them that if they will tell anybody in the camp, they will go up the chimney, and this was later on a key testimony of my mother in the Eichmann trial in 1960, and my first encounter with the law. So um, this is an interesting story, and maybe to conclude the story, you know, Holocaust survivors um, who emigrated to Israel, like my mother, um, can be divided into two very interesting groups, which is also an interesting topic for research. One group uh, that became very conservative, nationalistic, uh, we have to protect ourselves on the right kind side of the political map. And the other group, like my mother, who said, you know, my lesson from the Holocaust and from anti-Semitism that I uh, witnessed is uh, that I suffered is that I should dedicate my life to help the weak and the needed and she became a social work, later on head of the School of Social Work at the Hebrew University. And one of her last uh, uh, operation was the establishment in the first intifada of the Hamoked Laganata Prat, uh, which helps uh, Palestinians uh, to um, manifest their rights. And this is today considered by the Israeli government as one of the leftist anti-loyal traitor organization um, um, NGOs in Israel. So I think this is an interesting um, background, family background, uh, that merits also some uh, interesting academic discussion which I have never conducted. Um, but in order to prepare for this talk yesterday, I looked, uh, and as I said, I'm really an ignorant about anti-Semitism uh, from an academic perspective and law regulating anti-Semitism. I, I googled and I um, found some interesting data, which also merits, you know, my main talk is probably putting uh, in front of you some research questions, not really answering them. Um, that first of all, um, there is a big difference between anti-Semitism in sentiment, beliefs, and manifestation of anti-Semitism. And uh, this is um, from an organization, ADL, that collects data about anti-Semitism sentiments. And as you can see, 26% uh, of the world population encompass some kind of anti-Semitism uh, sentiment. But if you see the distribution uh, among the parts of the world, there is no correlation whatsoever between democracy and anti-Semitism sentiment, freedom of speech and anti-Semitism uh, sentiment. Uh, uh, these are some things that are uh, should be explained on different background, and this is quite interesting. And what is more interesting is when you check anti-Semitism violent attacks. This is the other extreme of anti-Semitism sentiment or beliefs, but actual violent attack. Uh, first of all, you see basically a growth. Uh, from the beginning of this century, uh, with a peak in 2008, the uh, economic crisis. But this growth, this is things that I might be interested in, actually correspond, corresponds to democracy decline. 
Uh, as you know, democracy is declining globally from exactly the beginning of uh, um, this century uh, rapidly. Uh, and this is something that we might want to talk afterwards. You know, we are thinking about anti-Semitism, about uh, very other, uh, other problems, various other problems in the landscape of liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is shrinking. Liberal democracy never was uh, the regime of most of the population of most of the countries in the world. And liberal democracy, which is in practice 70 years old, last 20 years is in decline. So it's really a very, very small dot in, in the history of mankind or the history of governance. I think that we should prepare ourselves to post-democratic um, states. Uh, and this is something that is also interesting, uh, might be relevant uh, in the context of anti-Semitism. Uh, when you look more closely about these uh, anti-Semitic violent attacks, this is uh, data that I retrieved from Tel Aviv University database. Uh, and this is something that might be relevant to my story about freedom of expression or freedom of speech. Uh, you see, first of all, that there is no correlation between anti-Semitic sentiment and anti-Semitic actual attacks. Uh, not within continents um, or regions, not within uh, uh, the same systems of government. Um, and as you see, and this is again a hypothesis that has to be examined much more uh, rigorously, that countries, and this I will talk about in a second, countries with a very extensive freedom of speech within the Western democratic world, um, like the US and the UK, is far more uh, violent incidents than countries in which freedom of speech is not a super right, like basically continental Europe, Germany and continental Europe, and actually um, in a sense Israel as well. So interesting, just you know, from a few minutes. Uh, um, search surf in the internet, I think that there's, it's an interesting conclusion that there is no correlation between anti-Semitic sentiment and a, a manifestation of anti-Semitism, which is quite interesting because as you know, law cannot address anti-Semitic sentiment, but it can address anti-Semitic manifestations. Um, and maybe one conjecture is that the dif differences is related to some kind of legal intervention with regard to the in lack of correlation between sentiment and manifestation. Um, but interestingly, uh, there is no correlation between sentiment, anti-Semitic sentiment and level of democracy, human rights and, and other general macro uh, government or society quality measures. And that there might be, and this brings me to the rest of the talk, that might be possible connections between attitude to freedom of speech and anti-Semitic attacks um, within the democratic world. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, freedom of speech and the different approaches, uh, the Anglo-American versus the European German continental approach, EU approach and that of Israel and bring uh, a little bit uh, of uh, legal Israeli legal history uh, into uh, this uh, presentation. And I will try to be very quick. I know that this is, uh, you know, cannot be discussed uh, uh, thoroughly, but basically, you know, Western legal tradition had three uh, traditions of freedom of speech developed independently for and, and differently. The French, uh, the Anglo-American and the German, the whole idea of freedom of speech was a very nice idea on the book, not really exercised until the second half of the 20th century. Okay, with the fear, periods of more freedom of speech, but more periods of much less and restrictive freedom of speech. And basically, we can talk today about two models, 
or two traditions of freedom of speech. One is the Anglo-American, which regard freedom of speech as ultra or super right. What the courts in the US did with freedom of speech in the second half of the 20th century and also in the 21st century is far more uh, extreme um, than uh, the concept that was developed after the war in Germany and actually in the EU, according to which the super right is human dignity and freedom of speech is subordinated to human dignity, which gives a very different balance between freedom of speech and other values, which might be very interesting and relevant in the context of uh, fighting anti-Semitism. Um, and this brings me, as I said, it's a very eclectic talk, uh, to the Israeli concept of freedom of speech, which is really connected to the effect or the influence of uh, the German jurists who emigrated to Palestine. And it's interesting to say a, a general word about the German effect on Israeli law. And one can talk about two periods, uh, the current period from the mid eighties until today in which you know the German Israeli ties are normal uh, or uh, normal in a very unique way. Uh, and there is no hesitation of the Israeli courts and judges to cite German law, to cite German constitutional cases especially. There is also a very good tie between uh, the judges of the Israeli uh, Supreme Court and the German Constitution Court. And German law is a major source for inspiration, comparison uh, for Israeli court. The first period, 48 until the mid 80s, was a period in which everything connected to Germany was taboo in Israel. By German products, people didn't talk about German, maybe culture a little bit. And uh, this is the period in which our public legal institutions, the Supreme Court, the Attorney General, the um, state controller were dominated by Yekes, German Jews. And their input into the crystallization of Israel Israeli law were, was ex implicit and not explicit. And this was the period that uh, Fania and I were interested in um, and researched. Um, and one can say that this impact brought the Israeli legal system who basically uh, inherited the British law and institution brought the Israeli legal system to be a mixed legal system um, the substantive law is really a mixed legal system. A lot of private law uh, shifted from common law or Anglo-American concept to a uh, continental concept. The institutions, the legal institution is, well, the attorney general, the court, uh, the fact that we have one Supreme Court, which also serves as a constitution court, is very Anglo-American. Um, and, um, and I want to talk for a few minutes about uh, the people, uh, these German Jews who um, had a real impact on the Israeli legal system through their position uh, in uh, the Israeli public law institutions. Um, um, a lot of German Jews were lawyers. Um, in Berlin and Frankfurt, about 40% of the lawyers before the rise of Nazism were Jewish. And the main Jewish immigration was between 33 and 36. This is the group that, of people that we talk about. And again, returning to my family story, this is a group that had a very, very good memories from Germany. Um, for this research, we interviewed several of uh, these judges. Moshe Landau, for example, said, you know, all the barriers uh, uh, um, dropped, we felt totally equal. Um, Chaim Cohen, who I will mention in a second, uh, who studied law in Munich and was present at the Navievsky affair, which was quite an uh, ugly anti-Semitic uh, affair before the rise of Nazism, did not uh, saw this as something that interrupted his very nice student lifestyle. Um, and 
these German Jews emigrated to Palestine either before the rise of Nazism for Zionist reason or in 33 uh, to 36. Um, and uh, some of them came coming to Palestine and, and confronting a very different legal system, left the legal profession, but the core group stayed in the legal profession. And by almost a kind of uh, historical excellence, they were very, very dominant in the Israeli construction of a state and a legal system. And the accidental uh, factor is that there was a small party, uh, the Liberal Party, which was mainly a party of immigrants from Central Europe, Germany, and other countries, uh, who won a, a few seats in the Israeli first election and became partners to the first coalition government. And this party was headed by Felix Rosenblut, Pinchas Rosen. Um, and he was assigned the Minister of Justice. And for this accidental historical uh, factor, um, the Israeli law was very much influenced by his Yekes, group of Yekes. He uh, was appointed the first Minister of Justice. Uh, a second very important figure was, and I mentioned before, Chaim Cohen from Lubeck, uh, who became the first uh, solicitor general and then attorney general and then the minister of justice for a while and then appointed to the Supreme Court of Israel. Uh, not uh, also uh, important, not of less importance was Uri Adin, uh, who was uh, appointed the head of uh, the legislation department in the minister of justice and he was responsible to the legislation that actually shifted Israeli law from common law to uh, continental uh, law in contracts and other uh, areas, as well as uh, I think your, um, uh, my commitment also in criminal law. Um, and the fourth person is Moshe Zmora, the first president of the Israeli Supreme Court, um, who, uh, by the way, both Moshe Zmora and Felix Rosenbach in Hasrosen fought with the German army in the First World War. Uh, he was appointed the first president of the Israeli Supreme Court and about 50% of all Supreme Court judges in the first three generations of the state of Israel were either born or educated in Weimar Germany. And actually the story of those who were East European and came to Germany, as you know, Germany was the gate to the West as it is now uh, came to Germany, became much more German uh, in their orientation, or especially legal orientation, that the German-born judges. One of the very, very uh, interesting examples is Joel Zussmann, who was Polish but studied in Germany, educated in Germany, who was also uh, the president of the Supreme Court in uh, the 70s, 80s. Um, so, the legal institutions were dominated by uh, German Jews, and I talked already about their um, perception. Uh, they didn't. They didn't encounter the Holocaust. They didn't encounter Germany uh, um, when Nat Nazism, the Nazis, actually exercised their plans. So their memory from Germany was uh, quite positive. I'm, I'm talking too much, so I want to conclude with uh, two, uh, some influences of this, uh, this group, uh, as I said, implicit influence, because they didn't really uh, mention, uh, with some uh, exceptions, uh, that there are importing concepts from German jurisprudence or German legal thought or political thought uh, to the judgment, but I want to give um, two examples that might be relevant in the context of your project. Um, I will not talk about the enlightened public, which is a very interesting concept. Um, I will not talk about the Rechstadt, which is an interesting concept, which is different from the rule of law, the Anglo-American rule of law, and it was basically this meaning of Rechstadt was imported to Israeli law. I, I will talk a few seconds about freedom of speech and militant democracy and um, the concept of a militant democracy and 
let me start with freedom of speech. So the discourse or the paradigm shift in Israeli law with regard to freedom of speech was very early, 1953. And actually in comparative perspective to the US and the UK and uh, uh, to Europe, this was quite early in the post-war a crystallization of freedom of speech as, as a fundamental value. And, and the, this very important judgment given in 1953 was given not by a German Jew, but by an American uh, Jew, Shimona Granat, a graduate of the University of Chicago, who actually imported into the Israeli jurisprudence the American discourse, the new American discourse of freedom of speech, and coined the a near certainty um, test for curtailing freedom of speech. Um, but this very, very important ruling basically was almost forgotten, uh, was very hardly cited until it was resurrected only in the 80s by Aharon Barak. And one of the reasons was that I think that uh, the German Jewish jurists in the Supreme Court did not really succumb to accept this um, un American attitude to the superiority of freedom of speech. And here I give you a small quotation from Moshe Landau, also a president of the Supreme Court coming from Danzig. Uh, uh, in a liable case, it is noteworthy that one of the most effective tools of Hitler and his a, 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 a accessories uh, to obliterate the democracy in Weimar Germany was the ruthless defamation of its leaders without proper response by the courts. Fear that this history will repeat itself. Actually, we are talking about today a contemporary period in Israel in which this uh, citation might be relevant. So the German Jewish jurist judges were much more restrictive with regard to freedom of speech and its balance with other values. Um, uh, until, uh, as I said, the 80s, where uh, Aaron Barak actually um, took the Kol Ha'am case and made it a, a, a very, very um, foundational case in the concept, the jurisprudence of freedom of speech in Israel. Another related example <coughs> is uh, the concept of militant democracy, uh, which um, was the court was facing as early as 1965 with a Yerador case. Uh, and this is a very interesting case in which uh, um, the Central Elections Committee decided without a legal authority to ban uh, a party uh, from running to the elections because this party was against the idea of Israel as a, a Jewish state, the Socialist Party. It was an Arab nationalist party, basically. And um, the party appealed to the Supreme Court and by majority, the Supreme Court affirmed uh, this disqualification. And it's interesting because the three judges of the, uh, on the bench really reflect the various tradition in the Israeli Supreme Court. Agranat, whom I mentioned before, the American judge, actually applied the constitutional American concept and can be associated with modern non-positivism or Dworkinian, according to which the, you know, the uh, in Declaration of Independence, which is not of any constitutional uh, norm or any valid legal norm in the Israeli legal system, is the credo of the state of Israel and everything should be interpreted according to it. And therefore a, a party that uh, does not subscribe to the basic social contract of the state of Israel cannot run to the election. Uh, we have Justice Zussman, I mentioned also him before, the Polish judge who became very, very German and became most of the, one of the most formal uh, uh, judges of the court, um, expert in civil procedure. And he couldn't go with a granat to this kind of grant interpretation, interpretive uh, um, project. So he actually brought natural law uh, in order to, uh, justify 
the, um, the, the disqualification of the party. And in the dissenting opinion was Justice Cohen, who took a very positivist approach, also very German, uh, with no explicit authority in the law, the committee decision is illegal. I wish there was a, a, an authority in, in the law, but there is no such thing, you know, in, in, in Chaim Coins and in some countries, there are values of several kinds of the state security, religion, achievement of, of, uh, achievement of revolution or the danger of counter revolution, which pardon and so, and uh, they invented natural law, which is um, can annul law when uh, the need arises on the ground of necessity. All these are not the ways of the state of Israel, it's the ways of law uh, uh, as explicitly authorized by the Knesset. But uh, in a kind of subversive remark, he uh, refers the Knesset to uh, the constitution of the Federal Republic of Germany and thinks that this would be a good thing to adopt. Okay. Agranat, the American judges, cites the Weimar um, lesson, not infrequently in the history of well-administered democracy, fascist and totalitarian movements reason against them using the freedom of expression, freedom of the press and freedom of association granted by state in order to conduct their destructive activities under the auspices. Uh, those who see it in the Weimar Republic will never forget the lesson. Okay. Um, anyway, 20 years passed, and here I will <laughs> stop because I think this is an interesting lesson with regard to confronting anti-Semitism. 20 years passed, and again, the Central Elections Committee disqualified them. Legislature didn't respond. There was no legislation that actually corrected or changed the legal, former legal uh, construction. And 20 years later, the Central Elections Committee uh, disqualified two parties. One was a later uh, uh, incarnation of the Socialist Party that was disqualified in 65. Basically, this is today one of the parties that uh, uh, is part of the Arab United Party. Um, this was disqualified. And another party of Meir Kahana, um, a rave racist, um, who uh, was disqualified on the basis of its racist views. And by the way, today we have basically in the Knesset an offspring of Kahana, uh, who was not disqualified by the, by the election committee or by the Supreme Court. Um, and not only uh, that we have uh, a representative of uh, a racist um, ideology, a worldview um, in, in the Knesset, you know, our prime minister does not, does not have, and doesn't have any problem to uh, uh, bring him on uh, as a coalition member in the government that he tries to uh, establish. Anyway, those two parties were disqualified and this was brought to the Supreme Court. And what is interesting here is that the Supreme Court uh, overturned the disqualification. And the interesting part is its attitude to the racist party, not the Arab party, the socialist Arab party. Uh, they ruled that there is no, not enough evidence to, con to, to conclude that they are against the Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. But uh, the racist party, Kahana's party, whose platform had a lot of similarities with the Nuremberg law. Just instead of Jews, uh, there were Muslims or Arabs. And the majority of the court sitting in a five judges bench said, we accept the Irador precedent, uh, a party that does neg that negates the Jewishness of the state of Israel cannot run uh, to elections. But it's not justified to extend this precedent also to racist parties, okay? We have two judges alone, also of German origin, and Beisky, who actually adopted Zussman's way of natural law as 
the uh, legal <coughs> cause for uh, uh, having the, uh, the power to disqualify parties, uh, but this cannot be extended to racist parties. And we have also President Shamgar, also of a uh, Prussian uh, um, background, who adopts a granat, basically a uh, Dvorkinian or a very broad constitutional inter interpretive approach relying on the Declaration of Independence. And again, he said that there is no reason to extend the precedent to racist parties. Um, and this is quite interesting because in a sense, it shows the Vi Weimarian failure of the Israeli Supreme Court. Okay? Heavy handed with the left and light handed uh, with the right. Barak, by the way, in this decision, departs altogether Aaron Barak, Chief Justice of Israeli Supreme Court and in the center of uh, our uh, legal political uh, um, quarrels uh, these days. Barak actually uh, brings a much more um, interpretive, broad interpretive approach saying uh, that there is uh, authority to disqualify lists, but only applying the freedom of speech uh, test only if there is a near certainty that these parties will be able to manifestate their platform. And whether, Bar and he said in the case of Kahana, uh, this is so marginal and he will win in the Knesset maybe a one or two seats that he will not be able to manifest his uh, um, ideology. Um, and this is an interesting uh, question if from a historical perspective of what we are witnessing today, Barak was uh, correct with his um, estimation that there is no near certain uh, danger. Um, so I will, uh, I talked too much and very eclectic, but I will very uh, be very happy to hear your comments and to conduct the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was really good. Uh, and it touches on a very important relationship also for our project, which is basically the relationship between antisemitism and racism in general. So, and I think that the Israeli uh, Supreme Court in general is, is giving us lots to unpack here. Um, I have uh, a lot of questions on my own, but uh, of my own, but I will give the floor or to uh, Tilo to give his comments on uh, this uh, very good. And uh, I just have to add that I'm super happy for the first time that we're actually recording this because accidentally um, my computer just collapsed at the beginning. So I missed the part. I came back when you just mentioned your mother very briefly, but I missed the very, so I'll watch it later. But Tilo, the floor is yours. You missed the family story. Wow. These are the best stories ever. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. It has been a pleasure once again to listen to you. And I remember, our, I think our last encounter is already quite a few years ago when we met at Travemünde um, on one of the law and economics uh, sessions, uh, but that's a long time already ago. <laughs> Let's hope that I will have a chance to come back to Israel very soon, uh, depending on my own vaccination, I assume. Okay. And we're, um, happy to, we're happy to host you in Haifa. Great. I, I will be happy to come. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm very grateful for, for your talk. And I, I have five, five points, which I uh, will simply uh, take, take up. Uh, the first one is... Um, uh, you started with a number of comments about the changes we are currently seeing, the decline in democracy and liberal democracies and so on. And I, I fully agree with, with this. And my, my question always then is what can we do about it? And uh, I think um, uh, with uh, regard to the debates among 
survivors of Nazi Germany, of the Holocaust, it's interesting to see that there are indeed different, two different, perhaps even more uh, approaches you can take. And I very much liked uh, your mother's uh, approach, uh, as will be easily understood. I think that an open society and a liberal democracy needs exchange, and uh, we need it uh, transboundary, transboundary exchange, cross border exchange. We have to look at uh, what uh, our friends in other liberal democracies do and learn from that, because probably by doing that, we will more easily identify the challenges, the risks we have faced uh, with. And that's why I always appreciated comparative law and pushing students into uh, a comparative constitutional law, because I believe if you only know the constitutional law of your own country, you will not be able to properly address the risks, the threads, the challenges you're faced with, but you must learn from what the others do. And if I look at the federal constitutional court's case law on, on, on uh, freedom of speech, um, and you know it, uh, I think, uh, very well, uh, then the early days of the German federal constitutional court actually were largely or strongly influenced by the US Supreme Court. Um, with one exception, however, from the very beginning, and that was how, how, should, uh, how should the German uh, Constitutional Court, Federal Constitutional Court address extremism, radicalism? How should it address uh, the um, negation of the Holocaust? And um, I think in that particular respect, this attitude of not going towards radical freedom of speech, but having what I often like to call a moderated approach to freedom of speech is an interesting development. Now, I very much uh, liked, and that's my, well, let me add one thing for students, because we always have students among us, and that's a privilege. I always think, because without the young ones, uh, I think we would probably not have a future. Um, so um, uh, I think uh, students should take the encouragement to study abroad. And I've always appreciated how many uh, 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 student uh, exchanges and staff exchanges we have had between Israel and Germany over the last uh, decades. And I think it's a learning process. You refer to the case law of the Israeli Supreme Court, and I know quite a few uh, young German colleagues who, who spent part of their referendariat, uh, their uh, um, a practical training at the Israeli Supreme Court. And, and I think that's uh, of extreme benefit, first thing. Second thing. Biography is central. And unfortunately, uh, I think Reut uh, could tell much more about this, but um, uh, when, when I was at university studying, we uh, um, discussed a lot about our vorverständnis, about our pre-study uh, understanding of certain notions, certain concepts. And I think, um, this is more important than many people believe. We we may be uh, we may be able to a certain extent to to um, separate our history, our biography from what we actually do, but it's always underlying. It always goes with us, and I think we should always be aware of that. I think this is a central uh, element for our discussions. And this leads directly to my third uh, uh, element. Um, I think one of the aspects which um, we as lawyers, well, sometimes ignore is that we don't look at the consequences of applying doctrine. Yeah, we apply doctrine, and I think it's very important to apply doctrine because this is um, an element of rationality in our discourse. 
and also an academic element of our discourse, because you can actually you have certain criteria which you can change ad hoc. But this notwithstanding, I think it's always important to look at what is the effect of a particular ruling on the political realities. And I think you've mentioned a, 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 a really good example, and that's the uh, different treatment of um, uh, extremism, whether it's right or left. That's something you will find in numerous uh, court cases that obviously there is a problem in actually addressing this. And I sometimes fear that um, well-meant doctrine can be uh, uh, can have dramatic con consequences for for us if we do not contextualize. And that's what I tell students from the very first class in human rights. You have to contextualize from the very beginning. Uh, this is not something abstract you can just carry around and it, it will preserve you. You always have to look into uh, realities. Let me briefly address uh, the issue of which you illustrated with regard to militant democracy and the distinction between positivist, non-positivist and uh, uh, natural uh, uh, law approaches. I like that very much. I think this is something we are uh, confronted with in Germany. I personally must say um, that having uh, um, had um, a close look at the case law at the end of the Bonn Republic um, uh, with regard to how uh, radicals in public service were treated um, and so on. And then looking at uh, the development of the Berlin Republic and how we today deal with these issues has um, given me a lot to think about with regard to the notion of militant democracy. Yeah. It, it, it was a very prominent notion if you look at uh, the case law of the Federal Constitutional Court in Germany in the 1980s and uh, uh, early 90s, and then it somehow disappeared. And nobody, probably a generation, a full generation of students didn't learn about this concept of militant democracy, whether, you know, you look at it positive or negative, it doesn't matter, but you should actually be aware of it. And now there is some, some tendency to initiate a new uh, debate on this. And my final remark uh, goes to, um, uh, the interface uh, um, of, um, let's say, uh, racism, different forms of extremism, and in our project, obviously, we would contrast anti-Semitism, radicalism, racism. I think these are very important distinctions, which we, which we should not uh, simply uh, ignore. On the one hand, each case is distinct. I think this is very important to bear in mind. On the other hand, uh, we need to have general rules that are equally applied to different uh, phenomena. But uh, the challenging question, and that's uh, the question of equal treatment, very often is what is different and what is similar. So it's not so much the application of the same standards, but asking the first question first means, uh, is there really a difference between uh, a political party negating uh, 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 the Jewish state or a political party having a radical, uh, radically racist attitude. I think if we look at uh, the case law, and we are going to, to analyze case law in more detail with regard to how German courts, how Polish, French, and uh, uh, also uh, British courts address the uh, phenomenon of uh, um, anti-Semitism, I think um, it's, it's very important to actually, again, contextualize, and this completes my, my, my comment, uh, to contextualize because this contextualization is very important at the beginning of our legal analysis, not so much at the end. 
Yeah, the beginning of our legal analysis means uh, uh, which glasses do you actually put on in order to look at the case? And that's, uh, I very much like it was Rayot's idea to name our project Seeing Antisemitism Through Law. It's a way to look at it. And lawyers obviously do not have a single way to look at anti-Semitism, but they have a, a whole variety of ways of looking at anti-Semitism through law. Thank you very much for participating and for, for contributing, Amy. That's, uh, it was a great privilege to listen to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so I will, uh, I, uh, I guess, uh, Eli, you would like to comment on, um, on Tilo's comments or should I open the floor? Uh, maybe very briefly, um, you know, uh, liberal democracy in decline uh, prompts two responses. One is your response, we have to get together as a minority and try to figure out how we can confront this decline. And the other one is to think uh, what should be the future way that we should govern ourselves. Because I think that, you know, the part of the reasons for democratic decline is that the 18th century philosophical justification for materializing the philosophical ideas of how we should live together are not justified anymore because of technological advancement. You know, the whole idea of majority, of representation, um, it, was in the construct or in the constraints of the technology of the 18th or 19th century. And um, this is something that I think that we should also do a common project because we have to think about the more philosophically justified way to govern ourselves in the future. And the fallacy of a majority populism technological changes. Um, so I think that this is a very correct point, but from both sides, also how to preserve things, but how to think about real uh, reform. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop here and open the floor. Okay, so Other before people. I see hands or questions in our chat, I just wanted to say that what I really liked, and that's the, how I began, uh, I think that maybe when we were speaking in Hebrew, is that even if we or all the people that join us uh, to these talks um, do not necessarily know enough about anti-Semitism or academically uh, enough about anti-Semitism uh, from a legal perspective, the fact that you come with a different background may, means, as Tilo was saying, with contextualizing ourselves and our scholarship and our biographies, means that you come with different questions. So uh, you raised uh, very interesting and, and uh, it, different questions. And I would just, you mentioned Chaim Cohen, who has always been someone that I always need to revisit. Um, but I always give my students, um, when I teach law and anti-Semitism, I give uh, my students the chapter that he's written about his, um, about the, the, the work on the trial of Jesus that he was asked to uh, attend to. And I was just wondering if maybe you know, it's, it's not necessarily something that you've mentioned, but you said that when he was dealing in Germany with the, the Sadevsky okay, uh, affair, that he was quite comfortable with it or that he had continued a pretty comfortable life simultaneously to dealing with this case. But I do wonder how, I mean, I'm pretty sure that the, 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 the trial of Jesus case that was brought before him and the, the Supreme Court had to deal with um, maybe evoked other reactions from him and, and, you know, the trial of Jesus. So I don't know if you guys know, but like the, I think it was with the establishment of Israel, a group of, uh, I think it was, um, a, a Protestant Christians who came, uh, to the Supreme Court asking, uh, the Supreme, the Israeli Supreme Court to address, readdress, uh, you're a uh, mute, so you should, uh, unmute yourself. And I, I was, dis I was disconnected and... Oh, um, you mentioned Chaim Cohen, so it will be great if you... Okay, so no, I was just saying that uh, I wonder if you would know how Chaim Cohen um, uh, dealt with, uh, with, I mean, how he felt when he dealt with uh, the, the trial of Jesus case that he was confronted with in comparison to the Sadovsky, Sadovsky or, or am I saying it right, Sadovsky case that he was dealing with in Germany, because you were saying that 
he, you know, that anti-Semitism during his time in Germany, you know, was not something that he unpacked in a very serious way. And I'm just wondering if, if you know how that has impacted him in, you know, academic uh, manner or personally in a different way when the trial of Jesus would. So, uh, you know, with the establishment of Israel, the Supreme Court had to kind of, uh, was asked by Protestant Christians to revisit the trial of Jesus. And then uh, Chaim Cohen took that uh, case very seriously. And actually, I think he even wrote a book, but I always uh, give my students the chapter um, on, on this topic. And, and I love it. I mean, I, I, because I, I just think, you know, he's doing such a legal um, uh, historical uh, work there. Um, so, so again, this is, you confront antisemitism even through something like that, right? Like, so maybe religious antisemitism, but you, he confronted it with legal means. So he tried to see it, um, see antisemitism through law, so to speak, with that uh, case. Um, and I will, yeah, I have other questions, but I'll just leave it with that and, and then give the floor to Joram that I see.